Several months ago, I released a video about Nikola Tesla's invention of the induction motor. If you haven't seen that video, it would be helpful if you watched that first, but it's not gonna be required because I'm gonna show you the important segment here in just a minute. After that video went live, I got a huge influx of emails and comments from people asking me about all these different free energy devices they're seeing on YouTube. Which ones are real and fake? You know, did Nikola Tesla invent a device that was suppressed by the government? After reviewing a whole bunch of these videos, I've decided rather than going through them one by one and trying to tell you what works and what doesn't, I've decided to answer two really key questions. The first question is, why would somebody bother to make a fake video about free energy? And number two, how can I tell whether a device is real or not? And those are the questions we want to answer today. There's a couple concepts about how motors work that I want to make sure we're on the same page on. And I've covered this in great detail in that Nikola Tesla video that I introduced. There's a three minute segment that's really important. So important, in fact, I'm going to show it to you here again. Even if you've seen that video, I ask that you please watch this next three minutes to make sure we have exactly the same information in our heads before we go into the next part where I explain how to tell the difference between what works and what doesn't. When you run electricity through a wire, there's a magnetic field produced around the wire. In fact, that magnetic field has a north and a south pole. To demonstrate this, I'm gonna use this compass that I have laying on my workbench here. North is directly behind me, and this wire currently is connected to a circuit that is off. If I turn the power on, and apply some voltage, you'll see that the compass needle is starting to turn to align itself with the magnetic field of the wire. That's because that magnet is a whole lot closer than the Earth's magnetic field. When I turn the power off, it goes back to the Earth's magnetic field. It gets even better though. If you take the wire and coil it up all in the same direction, the strength of the magnetic field increases. And if you take a piece of iron and shove it in the middle, that also increases the magnetic field. To illustrate how this works, I've taken this transformer out of a microwave literally just a few minutes ago. What's important to us is that it's a piece of iron with two coils of wire inside of it. The one on this side is wrapped way more than this side, so we're going to use this one. And if we put electricity through it, we ought to be able to turn this thing into a magnet. So right now, it's not magnetic, right? But we put power on it, and now let's start to run some current through it. Okay, that's definitely pulling on it now. And let's put a little more. Yeah. Okay, we have an electromagnet. So now we ought to be pretty comfortable with the idea that if we run electricity through a wire, we're gonna get a magnetic field around the wire. And that magnetic field gets stronger if you coil the wire up. This also works in reverse. If we move a magnet over a wire, we get electricity. Let me show you. This is just a stack of ceramic magnets, and as you can see, as I move it closer to the coil, I'm starting to read a voltage on my multimeter. And that's because electricity is actually starting to flow through this top coil here. If I move it a little faster and a little closer, I actually get higher voltages, meaning that more electricity is flowing. But there's one more thing you wanna know before we move away from this, is if the magnet is still, there's no voltage. There has to be relative motion between the magnet and the coil of wire. As long as I'm inputting some motion, I'm gonna get a voltage there. Pop quiz, I hope you were paying attention because here we go. In the last clip, I said that the voltage reading indicated that electricity was flowing through the meter. But where is the power coming from? A, it's coming from the multimeter. B, it's coming from the magnet, obviously. C, it's coming from the atmosphere, obviously. D, it's coming from my waving hand, obviously. While you're thinking about that first question, I'm gonna pose the second question. This is a question I get about once a month on my website, and it usually goes something like this. Why don't electric cars like the Tesla have an alternator? For those of you who don't know, the alternator in your car with the gas engine recharges the battery as you drive. So the gasoline engine is turning the alternator, the alternator puts electricity into your batteries, and that allows you to start your car. The logic goes like this. If you have an electric car, you could connect an alternator to the motor, and then the output of the alternator goes to the batteries and you have an infinite loop of energy. While you drive around, you charge up the batteries, the batteries drive the car, and thus 
you never need to plug your car in. We're gonna revisit this idea in just a little bit. Here on my workbench, I've got two permanent magnet DC motors. As you saw in the illustration before, electricity can produce magnetism and magnetism can produce electricity. That works at the motor level as well. If you spin the shaft on a permanent magnet DC motor, it will behave like a generator. And I can prove that to you by simply plugging this motor into this motor. And just so you know, there's no trickery going on here. I'll try to keep all these cables up on the workbench. I literally have the input of this motor connected to the input of this motor. And if I spin the shaft, you can see that this motor is behaving like a generator, which is sending a small amount of electricity through these wires into this motor. And it's like this motor being plugged in, it causes the shaft to move. This works in the other direction as well, as you can see. This one can behave like a generator. This one can behave like a generator. But here's where things start to get interesting. Why can't I just connect this output to this output? And therefore, let's see here. Oh, convenient enough. I've got a rubber band in there. What happens if I do this? And I spin this motor. What should happen is I get electricity out of here, which runs into here, which makes that spin which makes that spin, which gives me electricity, and I have an infinite loop, perpetual power, right here on my workbench. Want to see what happens? There's one element that's missing. We need some way to get the system started, right? Like, it's obviously not doing anything now, but based on the logic we just displayed, this should run forever. In the last video I watched on this topic, they actually wound a cable around the pulley of one of the motors, yanked it like they were cranking a gas lawnmower, and then that supposedly fired the system off, and it ran in the video. I'll give you some examples of how you can fake something like that here in a little bit. Even with one continuous shot, it's really easy to fake. That actually brings me to the first question I brought up, which is why would somebody bother to set all this up and pretend to produce energy when they don't actually produce energy? In the video, they usually claim that it's some sort of government cover-up and that they are trying to share this secret device with the world. So here's the deal. Whenever there's an opportunity to make money, there's gonna be scammers. They make these videos because people click on it out of curiosity, and that's all they need. It's like the ultimate scam. I don't have to convince you to give me money personally or give me your bank account information. I just need you to click on the thumbnail and watch for a little while, and I'll make money. It's beautiful. When you get to the end of the video, you don't have to believe a thing that you just saw. And this is actually why I'm not showing you any clips from those videos, because number one, if I explain to you how one guy did it, the next guy is just gonna fake it a little bit better. And number two, I'm gonna put a link in the description to tell you where I got the clip from, and then you're gonna go watch it, which means they're gonna make money from my video. And I don't want those rascals to make anything off of me. So I'm just not gonna do it. Here's the problem with this setup, and also the problem with the call alternator example. If I pull on this pulley, now I've got a pretty terrible connection here, but you can see they are indeed turning. Well, actually, let me make sure they're not fighting each other because I don't want anybody to say, okay, yes. So the way the generators are set up now, they spin in the same direction. So it should be perpetual. All right, let's try that again. It doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. It's really easy to prove to yourself that this doesn't work. All you need to test this is two little tiny hobby DC motors. Heck, you can get them out of your kids' broken toys. They're gonna have permanent magnet DC motors in them. Couple the two shafts together, connect the wires together, you will have exactly this setup. In fact, you will have a more efficient setup because connecting them with a belt is actually not the best way to transmit power. There's power loss in the belt. The belt's gonna be flopping around, heat is building up, friction is building up when the belt slips a tiny bit, and all of that is energy loss. This is why when I built my dynamometer, which was designed to carefully measure horsepower accurately at the shaft, I coupled the shafts directly together. I'm mostly just using a rubber band to poke fun at the idea that you could get power from a system like this. Whenever you design any mechanical system that uses belts or even gears, there's gonna be some power loss in that transmission However, it's set up. Belts can slip a little bit, there's gonna be friction and heat, and all of that is some of the power leaking out of the system. You also can't get more power out of the system than you put back in. So even if the system was 
perfectly perpetual and 100% efficient, which is impossible, then this would be self-running, but you could not possibly plug something else into the system. Because if you bled off even a tiny bit of energy, the system should stop. Every regular motor on the market has some sort of inefficiency. In fact, most motors will tell you right on the label what the efficiency is. In fact, I'll put some labels on the screen here for you. And as you can see, there is an efficiency rating that tells you how much power is lost by running this motor. Now, just to be clear, if you have an efficiency of say 80%, that means that if your motor is drawing 100 watts from the wall, then only 80 watts of power is coming out at the shaft. 20% of that power is lost through heat, uh, friction in the bearings, things like that. Electrical losses, there are lots of little places where some power is simply lost. So if we spin this shaft and only 80% of that comes out and goes back into this motor, and then this motor is also inefficient, so now only 80% of that 80% is coming back out, and then you've, only, you've got some loss again, what will happen is within just one rotation, that cycle is done. You don't have enough power to keep the system running. You certainly couldn't plug something else in to the system. Another misconception that we see in some of these free energy videos is the idea that magnets can be used to do work on other magnets. Any video where you see a set of permanent magnets pushing on another set of permanent magnets perpetually, it is being faked. There is an external source supplying energy to the system. There has to be. And this is evident, all you have to do is play with magnets. When you try to push them together, there is a repelling force there, but you notice that when I stop pushing on it, right now I'm supplying the power. When I stop, the magnets stop. If I flip them over and align the poles, they snap together, but they always go to a steady state. The same thing will happen when you spin two sets of magnets near each other, they will lock together and go to a steady state. It doesn't matter how much energy you input at the beginning, any extra energy is just from what you put in the system. Once the magnets are strong enough to overcome that input energy, it stops. So it's better to think of magnets as being more like a spring. I can use these magnets and there's potential energy when I shove them together and force them together, that potential energy can be released the same way that potential energy can be released from a spring. Now some physicist who's got their doctorate in magnetism is gonna give me a hard time about this, but I think this is a pretty good analogy to say that potential energy is being stored when I squeeze these two together and when you release it, you can get power from that, but the original power source came from my hand. Even when one of these magnets is an electromagnet, in that case, the external power source is the power plant. It's not free energy, that energy is being produced somewhere, and it's not the atmosphere. It's from a measurable source that is exhaustible. So let's revisit this idea of putting a car alternator in an electric car. We just learned a few minutes ago that no generator is perfect, there'll always be some energy loss. That means that your car alternator is gonna need to draw 100 watts of power to put out 80 watts of power into the battery, using our example from before. That doesn't account for any power that's being used to actually drive the car. That's a whole separate thing. Your electric motor is not only putting out enough power to drive the car, it's drawing enough additional power from the battery to also run the alternator. So we can just ignore the electric motor for a moment and just say that the alternator is running off of the battery. And what you end up with is the battery is losing 100 watts and getting 80 watts back. And you can see very quickly, we've wasted a whole bunch of power. And this is why car manufacturers don't put them in cars because you're literally just wasting extra power. There's no benefit to having it there. In one of these videos where they claim the power is coming from the magnets, they actually take apart the alternator. This particular version has been copied many times actually, but they take apart the alternator, cut out the wiring on the inside on the rotor, and then epoxy on neodymium magnets. First of all, you've just made a terrible generator. It's much less powerful now than it was a few minutes ago before you cut the wires out. Now that you've got permanent magnets on there, they're not distributed evenly enough. The rotor itself needs to be really well balanced in order to spin it at a high rate of speed. Machines can do this very easily, but in these videos, the guy is manually gluing on these magnets, which is just ridiculous. I think this is insane, and I don't think you could actually spin an alternator like that. In my opinion, when you see this later on in the video, they've just simply put a different alternator there 
and done the same wiring on the outside. But even if you manage to get it balanced enough that you don't shake your assembly to death, it certainly wouldn't produce more power than it takes to spin the thing up. That part is just ridiculous. What I wanna talk about now is how you might fake something like this because that's actually one of the things that I want you to you know, be paying attention to. In that one video that I was talking about with a ridiculous number of views, they took a power strip like this, connected an alternator to one end of the system, and then plugged the motor into the other end of the system. And supposedly the alternator was powering the power strip and then the power strip was running the motor. The motor was connected to the alternator and therefore you had a perpetual system. So I've got a power strip very similar to what you just, to what's in that video. And let's tie this thing down so it doesn't move around on me while I'm plugging and unplugging things. All right, I need zip ties, one second. So the basic idea is you plug your motor into this, your alternator is connected here. So power coming in through your alternator will power the strip and then the strip powers the motor. They're connected together. Okay. So here I have an extension cable. I'm gonna plug this in right here and plug that in the wall. Okay. And here we have our light bulb, but there's actually another option. You see, instead of plugging in a power tool or something else, which is what it looks like they're doing in many of these demonstration videos, we could plug something else in to this scenario. For example, uh, okay, so I'm unplugged, right? But I can make an extension cord, which looks like this. Got two male ends on it. As you can see here, it's all the same cord. I'm gonna plug this in and uh, try not to electrocute myself with the two wires sticking out. Yes, that is a hazard you should be cautious about. But when you're trying to make the big bucks on YouTube, you risk it. Okay, so plug this in. Oh, what do you know? That also works. So it took me less than a minute to make that extension cable. And if you have three or four things plugged into this, and the cables are running off into the background everywhere, like I've seen in many of these videos, there's no reason that one of those extension cords couldn't just be a double-ended extension cord that allows you to power your alternator or your electric motor in this case, which will make the whole system look like it's running. In actuality, this is powering your power tools as well as running the motor and spinning the whole system. There are other ways to fake this as well. For example, I could make it look like that cable is not there, like this. Now you don't see the cable and there was no jump cut there, as you just noticed. The only thing that's happened is I've split the screen and recorded some time with that cable unplugged. That's all it takes. Now I didn't spend very much time working on this, but I can promise you, any one of you can do this with a five minute tutorial in Adobe Premiere from a YouTube video. Whenever you see one of those clips where they say, oh, you know, this was all one take and we didn't have any trickery here. All you have to do is watch somebody like Captain Disillusion to learn the unbelievable number of ways that people can manipulate the footage to make it look like something is happening in real time uncut. When in reality, you're watching two cuts right now. There's another slightly more challenging, but certainly doable way to manipulate this. And that is I can gut one of these and put a smaller motor inside of it. And then I have a belt driven or direct drive system coupled inside of the motor itself that will spin the fan and the blade on the outside. The little motor on the inside can be powered by a battery and that can make the system spin for several minutes at a time. Remember, they can cut this footage together and try over and over again as many times as they need. So let's say one time they accidentally exposed a wire you wasn't supposed to see. I mean, shoot it again. All you have to do is try and try until you nail it all in one shot and then you've got it. You release your video, you get millions of views. Now that I've said all that, there are some things that I wanna make very clear. Number one, I don't profess to know every possible way to generate energy. There are definitely some things that we haven't discovered yet, but this is not it. This is garbage and I wish these people would stop doing it. But again, as long as there's a way to make money from it, these people are gonna to continue to make these videos. In fact, the idea of perpetual motion goes back thousands of years. So we are not by any means the last generation to deal with this problem. 
This will continue on as long as man is fascinated with ways to get low cost or free energy. Now, there are forms of free energy that we can use today, like solar power, there's wind, there, which really is another form of solar power if you think about it. I certainly think your time will be well spent figuring out ways to capitalize on things like solar and wind power, but don't waste your time with this garbage. There are a few things that they try to do to give themselves more validity. For example, they hide their face and then cover that up by saying something like, oh, you know, I don't want the government to come after me because it's a government cover up. That is a ridiculous claim by any means. It will not take very much for the FBI to figure out who's producing videos on a particular YouTube channel. I don't mean to imply that I don't think that there are government cover-ups. Of course there are. I mean, there is everything from the Watergate scandal to on and on. Certainly there are government cover-ups, but this <laughs> is not one of them. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing so hard because I'm thinking about Mehdi right now. There's one clip in one of his videos where he's talking about free energy where he gets up and just smacks the camera. There is no free energy device. Uh, yeah, I love that dude. Another thing that they'll say very often is it's not free energy, the energy is coming from the magnets. But as I demonstrated earlier, you can put energy into the system and store it like potential energy, which is the demonstration I showed earlier, a lot like springs, but the spring by itself is not gonna do any work. And the permanent magnet by itself is not gonna do any work. That is false. Thanks for watching.